Um, <laughs> for those of you that may not have heard Sunday's message, it kind of sets the tone for what I hear God is saying for us to do this month. It's very much just uh, focusing, especially on what this month is about, <clears throat> but putting it in perspective, like it's every month, every Hebraic month, there's general characteristics that are for the month, but if you will uh, tap into Holy Spirit, he will give you your particular piece for that month. So the month is not only corporate, but it's personal. So you should ask, what's the part of me that I need to get straightened out? What's the part of me that I need to do this month? What's the part of me that, <clears throat> you know, because like I said, I've been doing this for the month's part, I don't know, maybe eight years, something like that. And you'd think, well, now you know it. So you don't really need to redo it every month. But if you learn this one piece about how Holy Spirit will take you to a new layer and a new layer and a new layer, each time a new month comes up, then you know to look for it. One of the first things I realized when I first started studying the Hebraic months was I didn't realize there was an open heaven for those characteristics of that month. I just thought, well, these are God's promises. They're all the same all year round. Well, they are. Okay, God's promises are all the same all year round. But he's a God of seasons and timing. And that specifically will help you to advance up the mountain of God in a spiral motion rather than going around the same trail at the bottom of the mountain or halfway up the mountain. <clears throat> so in my case, I began to realize that because I had not been aware there was an open heaven, I didn't take advantage of what he was trying to pour out to me for that month or give to me for that month. So one of the things I encourage people to do is to not get stagnant in your thinking about, oh, I know what this month's about, okay, because I've done it twice, okay. Nope. It's kind of like reading scripture, okay. Yes, you might memorize it and you might have it, but the scripture has deeper levels is the best way I can put. And your first level or revelation of understanding is just a precursor to getting you to deeper levels. But you have to take the steps. Uh, I have seen very few people that go from novice levels to deep, deep, just like that. Because usually they're not designed to carry the revelation. It's not that they couldn't get the revelation, it's that they can't carry the revelation. It's like uh, if I pray for somebody that I have victory over a certain healing and I lay hands on them and by my faith I pull their healing down and they can receive their healing, chances are, this is the hard part, that if they're not in a place they can lose their healing because they're not mature enough or wise enough in the revelations of God to hold on to it. So. You want to still pray for them. You want to add your faith to them. But an even greater thing is to build them up so that they can get their own healing and they can actually hold their faith and do what they need to do. <clears throat> so this month, in looking at the characteristics of what is for this month, the biggest thing that Holy Spirit said for us as a community and us as a a group is that we're supposed to be walking this was the month that God ordained for us as believers to walk into our promised land and so that should be a very visual and word picture for you right now are you in your promised land are you walking in it physically are you walking in it emotionally are you walking in it financially are you walking in it geographically Okay, um, I used to think there is no way that this region could be a promised land. They're by here because I didn't like this region. Okay, it didn't have my ocean. It didn't have my mountains. It had red dirt, pink water. Yep. I'm like serious. Who in their right mind would call this the promised land? Then I visited Israel. Thinking, you know, this isn't so bad. <laughs> okay. 
Israel's mostly desert. It's greener there, <laughs> here than it is there. Okay, and to do their gardening now, they must have tons of water. If they put water to that desert, it blooms and grows anything. They have amazing fruits and vegetables and all these things. But if they don't have water, it's a desert, which is so symbolic and prophetic of what God's saying. If you don't have water on your land, if you don't have water in your spirit, guess what? You're a desert. You may think you're an amazing mountain or an ocean wave, but you're a desert. So he began to talk to me this month about the promised land. He has us in regions, times, and seasons. He has ordained where people are supposed to live. He's ordained cultures. I mean, that's hard for me to grasp that he's ordained cultures and that he's ordained these places. But the scripture's pretty clear about he sets the times and the seasons and where you're supposed to be. So when I got the concept of where is God's there for me, it changed my heart because before I wanted to be in my there. I wanted to be where I liked it. I wanted to be where I liked everything. And when I started saying, where is your there for me? And that's the God Shema. Shema is the God of there. The God that wants you in a specific place, in a specific uh, region in a specific job sometimes he's got he's got plans for us that he would like for us to follow the problem is discerning are there and like I shared with you one of my first difficult things was coming into agreement was his there for me he said, still water is my there. And I said, no, you must be wrong. <laughs> There's no there here. There's no there here. <laughs> I don't want to be here. I don't like it here. <coughs> I was raised in the hills and the mountains and the trees. And yes, we have rocks, but we like our rocks, okay? What on earth is this, you know? And I couldn't, I couldn't grasp how anybody would want to call this place there there. And so how could I come into agreement with God's there for me if I didn't even like his there for me? You see what I'm saying? So those are the beginning steps uh, that the enemy uses to keep us from our promised land. Because another way of saying there is your promised land. Your promised land is your there. So... With the tools, with the equipment, with the weapons, with the authority, with everything that God has given to us as believers, we have the full ability to go in to our there and make it look like the promised land. Do you see the difference? I wanted to just walk in and all the weeds are gone. I wanted to walk in and all the, I don't know if y'all, y'all probably don't pick up rocks out in this part of the country, but in our world, if you plowed a field, you were picking up rocks, okay, because there were just rocks everywhere. So before you bring anything to plant, you're going to have to pick up rocks, lots and lots and lots of rocks. And so, you know, that's why you see these little piles everywhere. It's not because everybody was so wanting to clean it up, they just had to clean it up to use the land because there wasn't much dirt on the land, it was mostly rocks. So what I realized is, if you really think about it, what do you think of the promised land as being? And most of us think of it as heaven. We think, you know, heaven's got, I'm, I can't imagine there being a weed in heaven. Now, if there is, it's gonna be a beautiful weed. But do you hear what I'm saying? I can't imagine there being all the things we struggle with on our land in heaven. I mean, that's not the picture it paints. So what we do is we think of the promised land as being that place. That that's, it's already done. We just get to walk in, okay? I laugh and say I've been married to a construction man forever, and I've only lived in one finished house. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
Now, Gary can't contest that because I still don't live in a finished house today. But it's getting a whole lot closer, okay? Uh, the only finished house I ever lived in was a double wide trailer <laughs> that we pulled in temporary to live in while we were doing political campaigns. It was finished. There wasn't anything we had to do. We just pull it in and plug it in. It was a new day for us, okay? Because most of the time we ended up with older houses that we were remodeling and getting to where we needed to be, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> I remember we got to a place in the house we are now where we were all like so tired of doing construction that we just kind of quit and just left some of the things to do. And we just stopped looking at them. We stopped seeing them for something to do. And it was when one of my grandchildren looked up at the ceiling in the dining room and said, what exactly is that? <laughs> and I had to think a moment, look up, and there was a wire coming out of the wall that was an electrical wire that was designed to be a low ceiling light all the way across, you know, like with a trough, like a hidden light. And nobody had ever gotten around to do it because that's when we quit. We were also <laughs> tired of doing it. So over the years, it just hung there. Okay, it, we didn't notice it anymore. It'd been there forever. It was pretty much, what exactly is that? And I'm like, that's a good question. Why don't you go ask your jeep mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's when Gary goes, oh, oh. Missed that one. We, we didn't do that, did we? And I go, no, we didn't. <laughs> okay. Now, we don't see a lot of those things. I'm sure when people come in our house, they still see things like that. But um, that's an example. When you start thinking in terms of God is not wanting you to wait for your promised land till you die and get to heaven. Where's your thinking? Where's your thinking? He's wanting you to bring the promised land from heaven to earth. He's wanting you to realize what does your promised land look like? What will it take to get your region or what he's given you stewardship over into that next level? Okay. Now, and he's not just talking about, let me make that clear. He's not just talking about, uh, the physical land, even though that's the highlight of what he's pointing to this month. But he's talking about you. Do you walk around being the promised land? Or do you walk around like I did, like, Lord, get me out of this place? Okay. I didn't even call this place home until I lived here for over 15 years. Oh, my. No. No, I'm a strong will, tenacious, <clears throat> stubborn whatever. If I said home, everybody knew I meant eastern Oklahoma where my ranch was. They knew it did not mean this tiny bit of acres <laughs> that I had in the middle of Payne County. Do you see what I'm saying? Even though I had a home, even though I had children in the home, even though I had an address, in my heart, where was my promised land? It was back on my private 12-acre lake that the closest neighbor was a mile away. You hear what I'm saying? So he had to do some natural geographic moving in my heart to where I would embrace wherever he puts me, that's my there. Now, I've put myself a lot of places that weren't his there. Okay, I think we all do. We do what we want, rather than asking him, what do you want? It's when I share with you how I had to take the journey and the steps of realizing I was taught, don't bother God with your day-to-day -day decisions and with your life, because he's busy, you know, yep. taking care of the world and the universe. He gave you a mind, now use it. And so I would never bother God with simple instructions or directions or questions or anything like that because, I mean, he was busy saving nations or whatever he had to do. 
or people that were really messed up. It wasn't until Holy Spirit began to be a part of me that I really began to make that change from letting Holy Spirit come into my every heart beat, every breath, every thought, every decision. Um, like, what do I do today? Do I turn left or right at this intersection? Do I purchase this today or do I wait? You see, those are things that we all normally do because we're so used to taking care of ourselves. But what changes is when he comes into that decision making, it suddenly becomes a super spiritual thing. So now he's helping you listen to his voice in such a way when the really hard stuff comes, you're familiar with the voice. You've got the voice. It's not a strange voice to you. Too many people wait until they're in pain or hurting or problems happen, and then they're crying out or begging God or whatever to fix this, and they can't hear his voice because they have not practiced hearing the voice of Holy Spirit. So in this month, that's what I want to encourage you, is he has an open heaven for you to hear. That's one of the things for this whole month. It's about hearing. And it's called, um, let's see, consider what you hear and determine how to develop a new level of discernment or oppose the counsel and advice. Listen carefully because you will hear key impressions this month. That's what I'm saying. So if you recognize that God is telling you there is an open heaven right now above you, around you, and he is doing everything in his power to push his voice, his sound close to you, he's asking you to begin to train yourself to hear that sound and that voice and to begin to let yourself get his impressions. <laughs> When I began to do this, what changed was I realized he really did care what I did every day. He really did care who I talked to. He really did want me to find the treasures of the people that he had assigned for me that day. But I didn't understand that because I was so busy with my day. I had a full, complete day. I mean, I had all kinds of things that were demanding my time, full-time uh, commitments, everything but he wanted to be a part of it rather than on the fringes of it. I was doing my day, and then when I'd have a moment, I'd talk to him. Do you see the difference? And what he wanted me to do is start making way for him to come into my every thought, because <coughs> that's how we begin to see his impressions, hear his impressions, and we begin to recognize what is my promised land. I can now say, you know, I look at the region and the area and the, the difference in my heart is I realize this was the place God wanted to pour me out for a reason. Okay, there was a reason he brought me here. There was a reason he had uh, our lives revolve around this area. And I can look at all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that we've touched or we've helped or we've done because it was our region. And my resistance to seeing this place, when I look out now and see things, I wish I could help you guys see. Sometimes I can just be driving down a road in this region and suddenly the clouds will form the mountains. And I can see them, it looks just like it does. Have you all been there? It looks just like it does when you're seeing the mountains in the distance. I can actually hear the sounds of the ocean, and there is no ocean in this region, okay? But I can hear it, because in different dimensions, this region looks like what God wants it to look like. In those different dimensions, it carries such healing and such glory and such love that all the things are like <coughs> vibrating with His it's a different thing. So instead of me, you know, Gary used to say, I need to get her to the mountains at least once a year. He called it my fix. 
Okay, I had to have my fix. And if I didn't get to the mountains, he said I wasn't a pleasing personality. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I was that bad. Maybe, I don't know. But the difference is now, I can be in that place in the spirit realm. Do you see what I'm saying? I can be in that place where I can remember and I can feel and I can sense not only the beautiful things in geography that I love so much, but the spiritual things. There are spiritual mountains. There is spiritual water. Okay. And when you allow your water and your place and your region to be anointed with the glory of the Lord, it begins to start ministering back to you. I was laughing with someone yesterday, and we were talking about water. And how come God loves showers? Y'all know how many downloads you get in the shower? Or in the swimming pool? Candy probably gets in the swimming pool, right? Because she loves it. Okay. I says, why not? I says, don't you understand? Water is the thing we all started from. You know, everything was created because the Holy Spirit hovered over the water. And it's one of the elements I think we're going to see more and more is we can't exist without water. We can't. Um, how many times does it say Holy Spirit is the living water? Okay. It's, it's his way of taking an element and when you let him have the glory in that element, when I change all the water that comes into my house, any water that touches my land, my home, my atmosphere, there is a barrier around it. It's like a filter, and it's a blood filter of Jesus. And I said, the minute that water, the second that water touches it, it becomes healed. It, the sin weight on it that it has carried because some man has put sin on that water, it's gone. So that water begins to be living water. That water gets to minister to me in my household as a living, breathing thing. Do you hear me? So there's no water I drink. There's no water that I bathe in. There's no water that's in my atmosphere. There's no water that can't come to me unless it's cleaned. Why? Because I realize the enemy loves to use the things of this earth to bring me harm. How many of you have heard people drinking poison water? or drinking uh, water that hurt them. Gary's whole life, he drank all this water and all they were doing is pouring tons of fluoride into the water, okay, in the panhandle. And Dennis can actually look at his teeth today and say, you're from either West Texas or you're from the panhandle of Oklahoma. Do you hear what I'm saying? Simply because they poured so much in, it did that to his teeth. <clears throat> Water is an example. So this is the month we're supposed to be hearing the things of God. So we've got to open up those channels and open up our hearts to say, what does my promised land, where is my promised land? Is it right here? Am I cleaning up my promised land? Am I cleaning up the water the way I'm supposed to? I mean, if you're not saying to every drop of water that comes to you, your sins are forgiven and you're completely released now and you can become what God wants you to be, then that's a tool that the enemy gets to bring to you, tainted water. And see, we don't even think about that. We don't even think like that. It's water. It's been certified. Okay. They got a certification that this is good drinking water. I don't know any certifications on how many spiritual sins are in there. And if the land can carry sin, and the trees can be perverted and carry sin, and the animals and the plants, do you not think water can? Which is older than all of them. Right. <laughs> See the point. So in us redeeming this month your promised land, you need to start activating some different things. It, someone told me one time, says, if I did everything you told me to do, I couldn't have a full-time job. And I go, it is not that bad. And they go, yes, it is. If I just prayed 
like you do. I go, no, 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 no. You get better at it. You get faster at it. You get to where you step into the quantum, okay? You don't have to spend six hours praying for every <laughs> single person you know by name. You just focus on Holy Spirit. That's what he's for. He is for us to be able to do these things. So the more he comes into me, the more he'll say, <clears throat> I need you to do this. I need you to do that. It's not unusual for him to change my course or directions a hundred times a day. Not at all. I've gotten better at being able to hear him so I can do it faster. And I don't argue now quite as much. Okay. We laugh about my clothes. Okay. Here this last couple of weeks ago, Gary goes, I'm choosing clothes. And I go, what? What? He goes, I found it. I found the thing I've always been looking for. And I go, what is it? And he goes, well, you tell me you can't wear this outfit. You can't wear this fabric. You can't wear this. You can't wear that. I found these knit things. And I go, knit things? Yes. And he goes, you know, like t-shirt. Oh, okay, t-shirt's good. <laughs> okay. And so he found this uh, clothing manufacturer that had all these <coughs> crazy beautiful dresses and designs and everything else. And he said, you better decide what you, I said, I'm Gary. And he goes, okay, this is the way we're gonna do it. <laughs> I'm gonna go through and choose all the ones I like. And then you can come through and argue with me. But we're getting close. I'm like, okay, fine, babe. He goes, you need new clothes. I go, okay, fine. He said, I says, why do I need new clothes? He says, because I'm tired of seeing you in the same clothes. Aww. What a sweetheart. Are you sure? I said, I don't mind. He goes, I am tired of seeing you in the same clothes. <laughs> I said, fine. Okay. So he did his thing, went through all of them, and I went through and helped him. Like, Gary, I know this is a beautiful dress. That is a beautiful model that has that dress. <laughs> I don't look like that model. I don't have the same body type as that model. So when that dress comes from the model and it goes to me, it's not going to look like that. <laughs> you get that, right? Okay. But I really like the dress. I go, I do too, babe. On her. But it's on her. <laughs> okay. When it comes to me, it's going to look a little bit more frumpy. Okay. <laughs> because we don't have those body shapes anymore that I can wear that. But... What I want to bring even in that is I've had to learn to let Holy Spirit even tell me what clothes to put on, why to put them on. And I used to say, I dress just to be comfortable. I don't really care about fashion. I don't really care what people think. And Holy Spirit says, yeah, you do. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you won't let me dress you. Oops. And I, shouldn't you be busy saving a nation or something and not worried about what I'm putting on my body? Do you hear what we do? He says, yeah, but if you don't learn how to listen in that little thing, how will you know when I give you a big thing? If you can't trust me in this little thing, <clears throat> how are you going to be able to trust me in the big things? And now he's doing this tacky thing. Do you trust the Jesus and Gary to get your clothes? Do you hear what I'm saying? Now I'm thinking that's evil, okay? No, I'm kidding. At least you trust Gary. I offered to go shopping. I know, I know. You were like, no. No way, thank you. <laughs> no, no. I'm still working on it. I despise shopping. <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. It's those little things. Now, most of you don't have that problem. You don't have a resistance to that. You don't have a big thing that, but you have other problems. Okay, it may not be close, but we all have other problems, right? Okay, so what I'm trying to say to you is you cannot see the promised land God has for you if you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and to let you see and hear and know how things should be shifted in your natural environment. Okay, your home should be a blessing to you. Your land should cause you great joy. When you are on your land, it just should be singing to you. 
it should be ministering to you instead of it going ick. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's, it's huge. We can't understand the kingdom if we can't see the promised land. What are you bringing? When you say, I'm bringing his kingdom. Well, what are you bringing? I mean, do you have to go someplace else to find it beautiful? Peaceful? Restful? What are you bringing? So we have to be able to envision and see what does our region, our area, look like as kingdom? What would this area look like if we had no crime? What would it look like? What would this area look like if we had no poverty? What would this area look like if we had no abused children? These are layers, these are frequencies, these are things that are in our region, our atmosphere. And unless you've done deep cleaning on your physical land, they're in your land. They're in the two befores of your house. Remember, all matter, all matter has memory. A two befores matter, wires are matter. They all have memory. That memory carries with it a frequency. So when that frequency is vibrating 24-7, whether you are aware of it or not, it's vibrating in your home. That's why you can walk into two completely, exactly built same structures. They can be exactly built the same way. But if someone has cleaned that structure, physically, spiritually cleaned that structure, you can actually feel, if you're sensitive in the spirit, you can actually feel as you walk in the difference between what's in that home. Okay? What we have become is the word we use in, in so many situations is desensitized. We have become desensitized because we have felt that frequency for so long, it's just like that wire hanging in my dining room. I don't see it anymore. Now now I have a beautiful light and nobody even realizes the light's there now, so I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but do you hear what I'm saying? How can you go into the promised land? It's not like in the days of Israel where God was saying, here it is. I want you to go into here. Do you realize they did not technically own the land? God was saying, I own everything. These people have just been on the land, and these giants have just been on the land and owned the land forever, but we're kicking them out. They are squatters. I used to think when I would read that, well, that's kind of cruel that God was just telling people, do you hear what I'm saying? You can go in and take all these people's lands and their houses and their vineyards. And their lives. And their lives and everything else. But what I didn't get was they were squatters on God's land. Hmm. Hmm. See, I didn't get that piece. Bing. Took me years to get that piece. The land belonged to God. God who deci decides who gets to say where. And the enemy, because of what the Israelites had done and how they'd messed up and all these things, they had left the land, if you remember, hundreds and hundreds of years before because there was a famine in the land. The famine in the land was because of things they did, you know, right and wrong, but they ended up. So it had been abandoned. Nobody lived there. So all these enemy people had come in and squatted on the land. So you didn't think like that. You were just thinking, gosh, that's kind of cool. You just decide, I like that house. I think I'm taking that. That wasn't what he was saying at all. But if you don't have your hearing up to par, and if you don't have your seeing up to par, 
you would have said, well, you know, we don't even know anybody in our family that's lived on that land. It's been like four or five hundred years now. Okay, hello, we, you know, we heard about it, but we don't really even, you know, know anybody. Think about that. So what you're going to have to realize is God's trying to do this month that same thing to you. To show you, I own all this. The enemy is a squatter. The enemy has brought crime and poverty and all these other things that you have gotten desensitized by and said, I don't ever remember it not being like this. I don't ever remember it not being where we're like that. So you can't change it to something else until you have a vision of what you're supposed to be changing it to. You know, I can come in and say, I want to build a house. But at some point, somebody wants to see the blueprints of the house. You can't build a house. Now, I take this back. I know a guy that built a house without blueprints, but mm -hmm. I don't recommend it, okay? I'm saying you usually need to have everybody be able to see the vision and to have the same understanding, right? Do you have a vision of what your promised land looks like? If you don't, guess what this month is? It's the month of an open heaven. It means he is doing everything. He is supernaturally putting it out there for you to begin to hear him in a deeper and greater way and to see the promised land and to make your faith activated so that you can come into the whole belief system I can do that. Is your promised land, does it mean your house has to look like a park? Okay. Gary wants his yard to look like one of those golf courses on Maui. You know what I'm saying? Just the green grass. You know, it's just, that's his goal. So we all just try to stay out of the way. Okay, that's the best. The children want to go dig things up. I go, mm, go dig in that hole right here. Don't, don't dig over here. Jeepaz Chris. Okay. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because he's got this vision that he wants his yard. I keep reminding him we're going to have to go a little deeper in the spiritual things to get rid of some of the stuff that keeps coming up to steal his vision. Are you hearing me? So, have you asked Holy Spirit? What does your promised land look like? What does it look like? Now, some of you go, well, I don't know. I've never, I've never had a dream. Well, it's time you get one. Or I can't, I can't think about things like that. I'm too busy trying to stay in my existence one step ahead of all my stuff. I've got to get done. Are you talking about physical promised land or spiritual? Both. Okay. Both. Because the spiritual promised land wants to manifest in the physical. And it can't. Because A, we can't even see a spiritual promised land. We can see heaven. We can do the by and by. But we don't realize he's saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what Jesus is saying to his Father God. On earth as it is in heaven. What you have done is said, the time frame from that, for that prayer is when Jesus comes back, he'll bring his work and it'll all be done. See, we put the time frame, Jesus has to come back. Jesus was saying, it is our job, our missional assignment to get that vision, to get that spiritual promised land and to bring it and to manifest it on earth as his kingdom. And that people can't grasp. Well, what are we going to do with the evil? We're going to kick it out. What are we going to do with the weeds? We're going to get them out. <coughs> what are we going to do with the rocks? We're going to pile them in a corner. 
whatever we have to do. Do you see the difference? We're just not thinking yet. So one of the things that he said for this month is first you're going to have to understand what's keeping you from seeing the vision. Is it because you're so afraid of the giants? Are you afraid of the giants? What are your giants? What is your fear? What is the thing that's keeping you from doing what God's telling you to do? Um, I've probably battled in this last year more than anything. Just the thing of, let me just escape for a minute. Okay, let me just not have to think about all this other stuff. Let me just, let me just go away for just a minute. I'll, just, I'll be honest with you. Because some of the things he was asking me to work through weren't physical things at all, yes, some, but most of them were spiritual things having to do with levels of forgiveness, okay? That was what my assignment this last year's been. I mean, and it happens every day. He'll, I'll go back to the place where I think we've done the work that I need to do, and he'll trigger something else. Who oh, haven't I? Oh, okay. I forgive them for that, okay? And then I'll think, okay, we're good, we're good. And then it comes back. Now, what that does, it's a different kind of work. I don't physically have a lot of physical work I do anymore. I do some, but not anywhere near like what I used to do. But now the work has shifted to a spiritual level. And it's much harder. Let me get on a tractor and plow mindlessly for hours. It's so much easier. I'm telling you. Instead of getting in the spirit and plowing in the spirit. That is not easy. And it's taxing on you physically and emotionally and all these things. So the work I've had to do this last year to get to the promised land is remember that I can't take any unforgiveness with me or I can't bring his promised land into a land that has all these rocks of unforgiveness still in it. Is that making sense? You hear what I'm saying? So, I ask him, what were the giants? And in my case, some of those giants were me overcoming um, being able to forgive and love. Okay, I can tell you I forgive you, but I just don't want to see you anymore. I haven't told anybody this room yet, so you're all safe. I didn't say that. I'm just saying, is that not what we do? Okay, I can forgive you. Just don't come into my atmosphere, and then it will be fine. Okay. What if you have to live with them? Huh? What if you have to have daily work relationships with them? Can you still forgive them? Can you still love them? Okay. In my case, the giant that would be overwhelming trying to keep me from bringing one more level of the promised land in is being that giant of unforgiveness. Because I can say I love you. I can say, Holy Spirit, you love through me to love them. But if I look at you and I still harbor unforgiveness, I have blocked the love. I can talk big. And I'm a very good actress. I can fake it. But in the spirit realm, they know. Okay? So let me read to you what our new ministry should look like. What we should, we should be looking like. Okay, if we got this right with the Holy Spirit. I'm in 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 3. And I'm just going to read just real fast here, and then we'll finish up at the end of this chapter talk about how <clears throat> he's talking about where we want to go into a new covenant. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to sound like those who, hi who speak highly of themselves? Do you really need letters of recommendations to validate our ministry like others do? Do we really need your letters of endorsement? Of course not. For your very lives are our letters of recommendation permanently engraved on our hearts, recognized and read by everyone. This is where God showed me years ago 
that I didn't have to have other people validate me. I didn't have to have other ministries say, you know, we like her, so you need to like her. Okay, you know how this goes. We all check to see who's, who's and I do that. I check to see who's endorsed this person or who said this person. But what God would say to me is, you won't have to build a testimony for yourself or a reputation for your ministry through big things because you're going to write your heart and my heart on people's hearts. So what ends up happening is all the people that I've touched, they are my letters. Do you see what I'm saying? When someone looks at this person and they can see they walked through hell and they came out and they're great. When they can look at this person and see this person overcame because I came in and just gave them enough courage and ministry to be able to do what they needed to be. This is what he's talking about. Paul's saying, I don't have to have letters of recommendation from anybody. Look at you. You are my letters. You are the people I've written on your heart. And as a result of our ministry, you are living letters written by Christ, not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not carved into stone tablets, but on the tablets of tender hearts. We carry this confidence in our hearts because of our union with Christ before God. Yet we don't see ourselves as capable enough to do anything in our own strength, for our true competence flows from God's empowering presence, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. He alone makes us adequate ministers who are focused on an entirely new covenant. One ministry is not based on the letter of the, our ministry is not based on the letter of the law, but through the power of the Spirit. The letter of the law kills, but the Spirit pours out life. This is where we have to shift our thinking because most of us have been trained in a thinking that does the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law, and that's quite different. Even the ministry that was characterized by chiseled letters on stone tablets came with a dazzling measure of glory, though it produced death. He's talking about the tablets, the Ten Commandments, the Torah. The Israelites couldn't bear to gaze on the glowing face of Moses because of the radiant splendor shining from his countenance a glory destined to fade away. Yet how much more radiant is this new and glorious ministry of the Spirit that shines from us? Again, notice and keep in mind that we are shining not our own glory, we are reflecting God's glory. So this is why I'll often talk about mirrors, and it does here in a minute. It's talking about this glory doesn't come from you and your accomplishments or your things that you have done. This is a reflective glory. So we are like mirrors because when we're in his glory, his glory comes and it does penetrate us. But it is what shines out. It is not us shining out. And that's where so many times our understanding of the promised land must be fixed. It's not our vision of the promised land we're trying to bring. It's his vision of the promised land we're trying to bring. Yet how much more radiant is this new and glorious ministry of the Spirit that shines from us? For if the former ministry of condemnation was ushered in with a measure of glory, how much more does the ministry that imparts righteousness far excel in glory? What once was glorious no longer holds any glory because of the increasingly greater glory that has replaced it. It's talking about in the Old Testament with the Torah, with all those things, Moses came down, remember, shining, just radiating. He scared him. He actually had to wear a veil for a long time because he shined, his countenance shone so much, it was like a ghost, and it scared everybody. Like, you're not real. You're eerie, okay? This is what he's saying. That was a measure of it, but it was going to fade away. What we now have the promise of is that the glory of God will come in us and we will literally shine out and radiate out to where people will say, what's different about you? Why, why do I want to be around you, but I don't want to be around others? 
What is in you that makes me be drawn to you? Well, let's pray it's this glory, this shine, this Jesus reflecting to us. So, the fading ministry comes with a portion of glory, but now we embrace the unfading ministry of a permanent impartation of glory. It's no longer all the steps you have to do, six Hail Marys and four three twos, this and all that to get the glory. It's yours. The gift of Holy Spirit is yours. You are the one who determines how much he flows through you, not anybody else. So then, with this amazing hope living in us, we step out in freedom and boldness to speak the truth. We are not like Moses, who used a veil to hide the glory to keep the Israelites from staring at him as it faded away. Their minds were closed and hardened, for even to this day, that same veil comes over their minds when they hear the words of the former covenant. When people, this is one of the things that the religious spirit loves to do. He loves to get people to understand the fact that the scripture holds life and that the scripture is God's word imparted to them. And what the enemy does is he says, that is all you need is the scripture. Hear me. I am not condemning scripture. I'm saying if that's all the disciples needed was the scripture, the Torah, then why would Jesus tell them, do not go out and try and minister to anything bringing in the harvest because I'm telling you, the devil will eat you up without the Holy Spirit. It's because you cannot fight human to spirit. And if you have just the scripture, it's how much do you believe of the scripture is what the devil counts. Because you could have a love and affinity for the word, but the question is, do you believe what you read? Do you believe it? Because the enemy does not care. I say this a hundred times a year, I know, or more. He does not care how much scriptural knowledge you have in your head. He cares whether you really believe it or not. Because when you believe it, it changes who you are. When you believe it, it becomes part of your DNA. And it's when the word you are eating becomes a living thing in you. The difference is, if you just read the word, it's like people that uh, have eating disorders. They eat the food and then what do they do? Throw it up. The food never gets to be a part of their DNA. And I don't like to use that example all the time, but a lot of people do that with the word because the religious spirit puts this thing around that it is, and this is what it's saying, it puts, it puts a veil on them. It puts a thing on them so they don't realize Jesus himself said, he knew the word. He knew the word forwards and backwards. But he realized without the power of Holy Spirit, the miracles, the ability to fight against Satan would not happen. So until now, whenever the Old Testament is read, some blinding comes over their heart. It's still happening today. Okay, But the moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. Now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit. And whoever he is, Lord, and wherever he is, Lord, there is freedom. So a lot of times when the word is saying Lord, it is not just meaning Father God or Jesus. It is often referring to Holy Spirit, which is a huge integral piece of you being able to recognize the promised land. So look at verse 18. We can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces. We're drawing close to Holy Spirit. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. 
Now, nowhere in it is Holy Spirit saying, you're reflecting me. But he is an instrument of helping you see how you reflect Jesus. He is that instrument. Because Jesus knew we could not figure that out in our humanness. So we need him to come in. We are being transfigured. That refers to, it means metamorpho. It refers to when Jesus was, let the disciples see him transfigured on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. This is what it's referring to. You have the ability to pull that dimension. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. When he was talking, when he was showing them the transfiguration, he wasn't anywhere else except for on that particular land in a different dimension. So he just pulled that veil back and let them see <coughs> that Moses and Elijah came down and talked to him and brought the glory of God in that dimension in the actual space where the disciples were. Are you getting that? If I could rip your veil back for you, you could look out into this field and you would see it in the other dimensions. You would see the trees and the grass and the spirit realm the way God intends it to be. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's that transfiguration. That's when we are moving from operating in just these three dimensions to operating in all those dimensions. So here he's talking about we are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. One level of dimension of glory to another and another and another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So if you and I want to move, if you and I want to get to this promised land, we're going to have to let Holy Spirit come into us even in a greater way. If I ask you today, and if I had this wonder measuring machine, and I said, do you mind if I measure how much Holy Spirit's in you? How much he's flowing through you? Would you mind me measuring you? Well, the first thing you go, well, yeah, I would. Because I don't think I want to know. Because I think I let him in. Well, Holy Spirit will do that to me. He goes, what percentage do you think we're at yet? for me when you're working at 100% of Holy Spirit in you you will do greater works than Jesus did how much is he 50% 20 10 2 how much of Holy Spirit is in you these are the things that we must get rid of. These are the barriers, the filters, the veils that he's talking about. You have a veil on you that will not allow the Spirit of God to come and to be in you holy. So he's going to take you on a journey this month so that you can hear and see in those dimensions. So you can say, what is the promised land? Where is it? What does it look like in this room? Are the angels in this room? Oh, yeah. Are the demons having fits? Oh, yeah. The ones that like to follow you guys around, they're outside having a holy cow fit. Okay. And when you leave, they're just glad you got away from here beauty is the more glory you take with you the less they can minister to you but I don't want to con condemn us or to do this I want to give you hope I tell some people I said yeah it may have taken me 30 years to get this but my goal is three for you that's my goal I want everybody to know everything I know within three years or less and then you go for the next level. Do you see the difference? 
And then that way, you don't have to spend 30 years. You have three years or less. You should already be doing everything. Everything that he gave me the opportunity to do, you should be doing and more within that time frame. Everybody. Everybody. And that's the, the reproduction he wants for us. So what is our promised land? Yes, we can look at our physical land, but let's look at us. Is the promised land residing in us? Is your health where it's supposed to be? Your relationships, your finances, your emotions? Are you reflecting so much of God's glory? Are we? That's where he wants more Holy Spirit. Okay? So I want to read this one little part because it's on chapter 4, verse uh, 4. For their minds have been blinded by the God of this age, leaving them in unbelief. Their blindness keeps them from seeing the day spring light of the wonderful news of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the divine image of God. So this is what Paul's trying to say to all of them. You don't have to go through the years of learning that everybody else does. We have the ability to, to walk in quantum. Quantum doesn't take 30 years. Quantum takes three seconds. I mean, if you wanted it that bad, you could have it in three seconds. Are you desensitized? I was and didn't realize it. There are things that would break my heart, and if they broke my heart, like watching certain abuses, I just didn't get near them. That way they can't break my heart. Doesn't mean they stopped. It meant I just didn't want my heart broken. So what God had to do is give me his heart. So when I went to places like India, and I saw the children crippled and maimed, and I knew that they had done that on purpose, that the mafia type people had crippled and maimed them on purpose so that they would get more money as a beggar. That was their worth to them. I would have been paralyzed at that. But the Lord was already changing my heart so I could realize that I had an assignment in this place and that he was very much aware of these children and that as we brought more and more glory, it would be the promised land. And in the promised land, those abuses don't get to take place. So if we each do our part, it's the weight's not so heavy. It's when no one will do their part because they're too tired or they're too oversensitive or they're too got too much stuff to get done. This is the month he wants you to manifest and walk into your promised land. It starts personally, physically with you. So what giants are you looking at this morning? If you need help, ask us and we'll help partner with you to get rid of your giants. I just love nothing more than slaying giants. It's a personal thrill of mine. It gets me sword fight. I love sword fighting. Let's go for it. Let's get those things out. Of course, then we have to bring in the healing team after I get them out of here. But there could be, I'm sure I could be better. I'm learning. I'm learning. Okay. So, Father, we just pray over this day. I pray that everybody, including myself, gets a better vision of our promised land. That we recognize what are the giants that have got the veils over us so we can't see or we're afraid to do something. Father, why do we become timid? Why do we come, become useless or, or ineffective when we have been given the ability to have the Holy Spirit flowing through us? So whatever it is that we're blocking Holy Spirit from walking 100% in our lives, Father, we just ask for help. We ask for your ministering angels to minister to us, through us, and for us. And Holy Spirit, just help teach us to be obedient in all these little things so that we can keep doing more and more of your exploits and that we can truly do just like what you said to carry this new ministry we have to have the ability to reflect jesus light 
So Holy Spirit, help us to be and carry your glory into all this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.